Are you curious about bodies, pleasure, and possibilities? And what about curious about what others are up to on the planet when it comes to pleasure, sex, and play? Have you considered what pleasure can do for your life, your body, and your bank account? Do you know something magical, delightful, and out of this world orgasmic is not only possible for you, but totally available to you? If you're ready to be the magical, sexual, sexy beast you know you can be, and you just need the tools to get there, you're in the right place. Now, here's the host of The Pleasure Zone, sensual movement artist, relationship, and sex alchemist, Milica Yelenich. Welcome, my sweet pleasure seekers. For those of you who are tuning in and you're a regular to this show, you might have been noticing that lately I haven't had a lot of guests on, but I have a guest on tonight. It's Alan Anand. And for those of you who are avid listeners, you've heard Alan on the show before where we talked, I think we, I think it was a few years ago when we talked about um, the dawning of the age of Aquarius and how in Vedic astrology, it's not the same. <laughs> so Alan gave us a very uh, bright new look at that to have a different perspective. And I always love a new perspective we have lots to talk about today. Alan has written several books and we'll be talking about his latest book along with about some information about some things he's putting together. So for those of you who don't know who Alan is, Alan Anand is a Vedic astrologer. He's a graduate of both the British Faculty of Astrological Studies and the American College of Vedic Astrology. He's also a palmist and much published author. His new age noir crime novel uh, novels feature an astrologer protagonist uh, whom one reviewer has dubbed Sherlock Holmes with a horoscope. Doesn't that sound freaking great? I love, for one thing, I love murder mystery and throw in some astrology even better. His nonfiction books on astrology have been praised for the quality of their research and writing. And his latest book, Kama Yoga, Love, Marriage, and Sexuality in Yotish is, I think I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, Jyotish? Jyotish. Jyotish. Yeah. Is a, Jyotish. Oh, that's pretty good. Is a complete guide to a personal relation to personal relationships as seen through the lens of Vedic astrology and can be purchased on Amazon. We do have um, Alan's information available on Inspired Choices Network as well as in the description links to any of the the podcast and uh, um, TV locations that you can find. The video description you'll find Alan links to Alan's uh, website so that you can get his books there. So. Alan, I'm so grateful to have you on. It's always a great conversation. You're always super playful on my social media, all about, you know, anytime I post something sex, you're there. You're always there for the sex stuff. <laughs> Not necessarily the other stuff, but it's all good. I appreciate that. <laughs> so what had you, first of all, I want to just kind of backtrack so that people can know, like, can you give us a brief difference between what is Vedic astrology, what is Western astrology? So those people who are listening can have a little bit of background on that. Yeah, sure. So uh, the, the basic difference between Vedic astrology and uh, what we call tropical Western astrology is the zodiac that is used. So for millennia, uh, astrologers or sky watchers would look in the sky and they would identify uh, clusters of stars called constellations um, that did not move. I mean, they're fixed stars. And the planets would be seen moving against that starry background. Those were the constellations as established by the fixed stars. But later on in time, uh, some astrologers began to use um, a different zodiac, which was slowly drifting uh, through the, the entire zodiac, where the first day of spring. So we all know the first day of spring is March 21st. That's when the sun crosses the uh, equatorial plane heading north. Uh, once upon a time, uh, that would have occurred in Aries, where if you sighted on that sun, extended the line of sight out into um, the uh, starry constellations, it would have been in Aries. Uh, but over time, that what we call the vernal point, the vernal equinox, slowly drifts backwards. It's because Earth is like a, a top spinning on its axis, but it's got a little wobble to it. So it's kind of complex to, to imagine. But anyway, this vernal point, uh, regresses slowly through the zodiac, such that these days, when you look at, um, you know, the first day of uh, spring, March 21st, and look at that sun and sight upon it out to the constellations behind, it's actually in the starry constellation of Pisces. 
So now Western mm -hmm. astrologers continue to benchmark all planetary positions against this vernal equinox where the sun is on March 21st, and they call that zero Aries. Everything else around the zodiac slotted into place accordingly. Meanwhile, Vedic astrologers and astronomers for that matter, will look at a planet sight through it and look out to the starry constellations which do not move and that is the sidereal zodiac which we use so the basic difference between the two is in time the two zodiacs separate by almost a whole sign so whereas you might think wow. you're you're a leo in uh tropical astrology you might be a cancer probably are a cancer in uh vedic astrology um, that along with the fact that uh, Vedic astrologers only use planets that we can see with the naked eye that's as far out as Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto could not be cannot be seen with the naked eye. And so until 1784, there was no Uranus in the sky. Until 1830, there was no Neptune until uh, 1931, there was no Pluto. Western astrologers have fitted those outer planets into the zodiac and their rulerships of signs. Vedic astrologers don't do that. We still use what is called an old uh, an ancient system. And yet, um, nonetheless valid, of course, and we stand by, you know, our choices. Yeah, for sure. So with everything that moves like that out of curiosity, so so technically I'm supposed to be in, in Western astrology. I'm a Pisces, so mm -hmm. born on March 2nd. <clears throat> um, when When this when this shift goes back and I could potentially be in Aquarius. You would be, your um, son would be in Aquarius, definitely yeah. in the sidereal zodiac. Yep. Yeah. So is there, so for a little look at both of these and they both have the potential to be accurate. I'm just curious about this part before we move on. Yeah. Is, is there like a comparison between like, if I'm, is, is like the Piscean sign similar to the, like, would Piscean, the being Pisces in the, what you call it, the vernal, um, was it vernal that you called it? Well, the, I referred to the vernal point, but I'm, I'm going to scoot ahead, I think, and yeah. anticipate your question. Yeah. Uh, all signs have qualities. Um, in a, in when you prepare a horoscope, it's not just the sun sign. There's what we call your ascendant or rising sign. There's mm -hmm. the planet that rules that. The moon is important. The sun is actually less important than the ascendant. The sun is less important than the moon. So there's many variables. In, at a very minimum, any horoscope has three key factors. The uh, ascendant, the moon, and the sun in that order of primacy because the ascendant changes fastest. Then the moon changes every two and a half days. The sun only changes every 30 days, changes sign, I mean. So, and there's a whole lot more. There's another, you know, um, uh, five true planets, you know, um, Mars, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn in, in the horoscope as well, too. Each one of those will be in a different sign and it will rule or have governance over a certain part of your chart. Perhaps the chart that rules children, perhaps the chart that rules a parent, perhaps the part of the chart that rules the career or the spouse or whatever. These are all variables that change according to the uh, the zodiac you choose to use to uh, interpret a chart and the the variances can be significant sometimes you'll get overlaps and concordance other times you'll get wildly different interpretations of course vedic astrologers you know are adamant about our system is the best one because it's been around for millennia it's still used in india to this day it's a long-standing living oral tradition whereas some western astrology let's say Hellenistic astrology, which was practiced around, you know, uh, turn of the millennium. And then for years and years and years, more than years, centuries fell into disuse, such that there were no active practitioners to discuss uh, how a uh, horoscope is interpreted. So all that was left were extant uh, ancient texts, which modern Greek scholars would have to interpret to the best of their abilities, knowing astrology or not, making sense of it within the context and trying to, you know, uh, uh, draw proper interpretations from the horoscope. As opposed to Indian astrologers, there's been a constant lineage. Grandfather would teach father, father would teach son, a living oral tradition. Nobody ever forgot what this meant and how it was to be interpreted because it never ceased being used, as opposed to Hellenistic astrology, for instance, where there were huge gaps in uh, application and knowledge. 
Okay. Long answer. So that's that's cool. So part part of the question was actually more about um, are some of the qualities because the qualities you were saying that there are different qualities in obviously in each sign. Like I'm aware of that. Um, do some of the qualities translate over like having i'm just using sun signs as an example because a lot of people can relate to sun signs more than anything especially yes. probably my viewers who don't have like a lot of experience having their astrology charts done yeah. or maybe they do i know that one person on here is actually very um very educated in that so yeah uh, <clears throat> so one of one of the things I'm wondering about is like, if I have, you know, they might say some things in Western astrology about what Pisces means if you have your son in Pisces. Are some of those qualities of Pisces the same as the qualities of Aquarius in Vedic astrology? So there no. could be a very different character completely. Exactly. And that would be the danger of trying to interpret somebody's horoscope based upon sun sign horoscopy only. Because a Pisces is a dreamy, imaginative, alcoholic drug user who's indiscriminate <laughs> in their relationships. Well, as that's accurate. <laughs> as opposed to an Aquarian who who might be, uh, you know, a very uh, interested in uh, history, research, antiquities, novelty, and who wants to sort of, you know, be um, uh, kind of an adventurer uh, in, in some respects to uh, explore things, you know, uh, using their imagination. So, I mean, some of those qualities will overlap, but signs, I mean, uh, what people exposed to the minimum of Western astrology uh, get over obsessed and placed uh, undue prominence upon signs. Signs are just a backdrop. It's like sitting in a theater and looking at the backdrop of the stage. That's what a sign is. The real action happens when the actors walk on stage. The planets are the actors. They're the moving elements in a horoscope that transit through one sign and into another. And one planet rules the ascendant and the moon is an important factor. Um, um, people often you know, get sidetracked, obsessing about signs, uh, and it's not the right way to interpret a chart. We've got to start with uh, the uh, the nature of planets, uh, and then see their see them contextualized uh, against certain signs. Against backdrops, I like that. Yeah. Really, that is a really cool interpretation of like the stage and the backdrop and the actors. I like how you explain that. So, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I've had I've had, and I've even within. Western astro astrology, I've had many variations of explanations of of, my, of the interpretation of my chart. So, and that's like you were saying, that must be like, it's that Hellenistic view that has changed over time because there was no oral tradition that got passed on. And so it's all an interpretation of those extant writings that could, every, it's everybody's an interpreter, like everybody interprets it different, right? So well, there are three major systems. There's there's Vedic astrology, which originates in India, has an unbroken tradition for a couple of millennia. There's Hellenistic astrology, which is popular today, thanks to um, a couple of people, Chris Brennan and um, uh, Dimitri George, who've published excellent books on the topic and done lots of research. Um, and uh, but it's it's being reborn as we speak over the last decade. <clears throat> but it was pretty mm -hmm. much a dead science for a couple of centuries. And then there's Western wow. astrology, which comes out of the Arabic tradition, Greek Arabic tradition, which has been more sort of ongoing throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and modern times. So there's three different kinds of astrology. And then practitioners, I mean, it's as varied as, as I don't know, pick, pick a, um, a profession, artists, musicians, writers, it's as varied as that. I mean, and people, um, you know, are exposed to different uh, material in terms of their education. They have different teachers. Some are totally book learned and others, uh, you know, take courses through university like institutions and get a thorough grounding in everything. So somebody who announces themselves an astrologer, their credentials could be zip or they could be extensive and you have no way of knowing the right quite or typically have no way of knowing the right questions to ask like where did you study who's your teacher how did you learn etc cetera, etc cetera. you know it's like a lawyer always has that diploma behind his desk says i graduated from mcgill or the university of toronto and you take that as you know evidence of a professional education with uh, astrology it's an unregulated profession uh caveat emptor buyer beware yeah 
and, and that's true for a lot of things and uh, sort of in what we'll call like the new age stuff, right? So sure, um, life coaching, healers and instance. all of that. Yeah, you could go from having like full on training uh, as a healer, or you could have that weekend workshop and now all of yep. a sudden you are out there hands on bodies. Yep. So uh, we're going to head to our first commercial break. When we come back, we're going to actually talk a bit about some of the content um, in Alan's book, how that might actually relate to you guys, why you'd want to buy this book and how it's going to help you out. So stay tuned. We're going to be talking about the book. When we come back, you're listening to The Pleasure Zone here on Inspired Choices Network, and we'll be right back after this commercial. Are you secretly a voyeur, wondering what's going on in other people's sex lives? What if now is the time for a totally different sexual evolution. Are you interested in people who are pioneers of different sexual and pleasurable practices? Lean in now with Melitza Yelenich, where she will entice you and your body to know your own pleasure zone. On the Pleasure Zone radio show with sensual movement artist Melitza Yelenich, you'll receive tools, inspiration, and a foundation to allow yourself to receive more in your sex life and quite possibly other areas of your life as well. Listen for The Pleasure Zone with Milica every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Central Time, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and 5 p.m. Pacific Time on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspired Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspired Choices Network radio host email become a host at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com this is the pleasure zone with sensual movement artist Melitza Yelenich. to participate in the program today join our live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com you can also make the choice to ask or comment by email info at melitzayelenich.com now back to the program Welcome back, my sweet pleasure seekers. For those of you who don't know Alan Anand, he and I go way back, way back in the day to when we were working at a bookstore in Toronto, and we were both doing uh, readings out of this place called the Omega Center, which was the kind of the spiritual hub store of Toronto at the time. There were a few, but the Omega Center was the it place to be. And uh, I would randomly run into Alan. And then when Facebook started up, found Alan again uh, in the Facebook land and have had the pleasure of having him on the show where we've talked about astrology before. So for those of you who haven't listened to that episode, please go back and uh, find that as well and enjoy that episode. I think for a lot of reasons I love having you on, Alan, is because there, is, um, there isn't a lot of talk about Vedic astrology. For one, we hear when I'm like on TikTok or I'm on Instagram, all the astrology I'm seeing is all Western astrology. And so I think there is like nobody's really hearing about it. And, you know, maybe um, maybe in this, you know, in the North American culture, we don't hear about it a lot. So I think it's fabulous to get this information out there for people to know there's other ways to understand yourself and get new interpretations on that. So if people would like to get, are you still doing private charts for people? Are you mostly writing these days? If people oh, yes. would like to get, yeah. Awesome. Still doing so consultations, you, of course. Awesome. Yeah. So people can get a hold of you. Do, would they get a hold of you through your website? How would they do that to get a hold of you? Yeah, you can probably just Google me, Alan Anand, astrologer or Vedic astrologer, Toronto. Uh, and the website that might get posted at the end of the show, navamsha.com, N-A-V-A-M-S-A.com. Um, that should do it, one or the other. Awesome. So if you're interested to find out more about what, who you are in Vedic astrology, uh, I highly recommend that you would go to Alan because not only does he have the background, he's has the education, he has years of experience in both Western astrology 
and in Vedic astrology. So um, uh, to me, there's a, there's a sort of a different uh, interpretation he can bring to you because he he comes from a background so he can actually bring you information that is, um, to me, uh, how can I explain this other than when you've learned one thing and then you went, wait a second, I need more information. Then you learn something else and you go, oh, there's some keys here that are really good. You bring you bring a different interpretation to it than somebody who's maybe only studied one or the other. So I think it's, um, even though you might, you know, your focus is Vedic astrology, you bring a different, um, you bring different knowledge to it. I don't know how else to explain that. So I think there's a lot of value in, in what you can add to, to a chart reading. So for those of you who are just joining in, Alan has written a book about, it's actually about, you know, all things fun on uh, that I love talking about on this show, like marriage, sexuality, uh, and all all of this from a different perspective. So it's called Kama Yoga: Love, Marriage, and Sexuality in Yotish. So can you tell us what is for one thing? I don't know this word Yotish. Can you tell me what that is and tell us a little bit about the book? Yeah. Okay. The word is Jyotish. So it's easy to say, Jyotish. just say Jo and then say Tish. Jyotish. Jyotish. Yeah. Okay, cool. So Jyotish is a Sanskrit word that means science of light. Now you think about oh. somebody lying on a hillside at night, looking at the starry skies and the somewhat brighter spots of light that move across the sky, which are the planets. I mean, if you look at Mars or Saturn or whatever, Venus, it looks like a star until you observe it over many nights and you see, okay, that thing's not sitting still. It's actually drifting across the constellations. So the science of light, because you observe it through the pinpoints of light we see in the sky, but there's also a sort of a metaphysical notion to that as well too. The science of astrology sheds light on our identity, who we are mm. as souls, spirits, personalities, embodied lives. So that's the, the combination. Jyotish, science of light. Jyotish, I love it. The science of light. I'm sure there's like many ways to look at that science of light in our lives as well, not just like lying on the, the ground and looking up. <laughs> we all have science a computer program and we can look at it that way too. Yeah, for sure. So what uh, what inspired you, first of all, to write this book? Like what was going on that had you go, I'm, this is it's time now to write this book? Yeah, yeah. Well, let me show you this book first here. Yeah. Uh, the Intimate Sex Lives of Famous People. OK, are you oh, interested? Um Yes, that's <laughs> yes, awesome. Of course you are. Well, <laughs> this is, is a modern volume that I bought a couple of years ago when I was sitting down to really work on this, because I got to confess, my original copy, which was a small red paperback, it was so dog-eared and torn, and it was like somebody once saw it and said, what, did you have rough sex with this book or something? Like, yes. It looked like really beat up and it was falling apart. I had to get a better copy. I was looking for it tonight and I couldn't find it. But anyway, I read that book some 20 years ago. And as I read through it and, you know, famous sex, uh, intimate sex lives of famous people. And I thought, man, if I had the horoscopes of these people, I would have a field day looking at their charts to see if I could make sense of why they had such, you know, spectacular sex lives as the case might be, you know, pick some oh, names, fun. Marlene uh, Dietrich, uh, you know, Marquis yeah. de Sade, Wilt Chamberlain, oh, you know, let's it goes talk on about the on. Marquis. <laughs> what is the mar where was the Marquis born? I don't even know. Well, Where he, was he born? Well, like uh, seven, 17th century uh, France. I've yeah. kind of forgotten his birth time myself now. But uh, anyway, there's a whole lot of case studies in there um, or profiles, uh, mini biographies, which I found very fascinating. Anyway, so, you know, uh, several years ago, uh, in part of my long uh, standing studies with my teacher, uh, a renowned uh, Western but Vedic astrologer named of Hart Defoe, actually a resident of Toronto who met his own Indian guru here in Toronto, did the classic thing 15 years one on one, a kind of a boot camp of uh, Jyotish with, the, with this fellow. And so he gave many courses over the years, and I took most of them. And one of them had a significant module to it, uh, was called, um, you know, passion combinations. It was all about um, um, love, marriage, and to 
a lesser degree, sexuality. It didn't, you know, amount to a whole lot in terms of a much larger course, but um, I went back to it over the past couple of years and dug into it much more and expanded it uh, to the best of my abilities and wrote a lot of case studies, uh, starting off with, you know, using this book, uh, Intimate Sex Lives of Famous People, as my kind of launch pad to see, you know, get good uh, bios. Uh, so I expanded this uh, whole thing into quite a substantive book. I mean, I thought I was going to write this book in a year, but between the research and the uh, case studies, and I had to read a lot of sex books too, because I, mean, I can't go into this just as an astrologer, right? My teacher right. always said, do not just be a one trick pony, you know, <laughs> <laughs> play your song in stereo. So I read a lot of really great books uh, on, on sex. And I mentioned uh, one of them to you uh, earlier uh, by a, a woman called Mary Roach, who wrote this yeah. book called um, uh, Bonk, uh, The Curious Coupling of Science and Sex. There's some other ones that are maybe better known. Emily Nagoski, Come As You Are, is quite her. a well-known book now. Yeah. There's another one, That's Kate a Lister, one. A Curious History of Sex. Yeah, there's some really brainy. Fabulous. A Curious yeah. History of Sex, I've referred to that a lot, and actually Emily Nagoski's book as well, but A Curious History of Sex is a hoot and a half. I recommend anybody go get that. Yeah, some of them are really good. The Story of Sex, A Graphic History Through the Ages. Yeah. Uh, here's a catchy title, A Billion Wicked Thoughts, What the World's oh. Largest Experiment Reveals About Human Desire. Called basically all the stuff you can oh. find on the net. Anyway, it that goes is. on and on. Um, there's there's a whole sex at dawn, the prehistoric origins of modern sexuality. Anyway, I won't read my entire bibliography, but I wanted to become infused with the subject. And I already had this other book for uh, case histories. And of course, the internet is a gold mine for, you know, you can start off with, um, you know, David Duchovny, let's say, you know, admitted self uh, sex addicts, right? Or Kanye West or whomever. Yeah. Uh, and look into their charts and see whether, you know, it fulfills the, the, um, uh, the pro forma. So there, there's the book, Kama Yoga. I mean, I hope nobody confuses this with a yoga book, but maybe re people recognize <laughs> the word Kama as in Kama, Kama yes. Sutra, Kama right? Sutra, Kama, yes. Kama just means the pursuit of pleasure. And you can pursue yeah. pleasure through listening to a symphony, having a glass of fine wine, or, you know, the coupling of bodies, right? And there's so many ways to, to enjoy pleasure. So this is just one of them. Uh, Kama Yoga is actually, uh, you know, a certain little combination in the horoscope that, you know, everything about your seventh house is wonderful. Seventh house is the part of partnership and sexuality. So when many, you know, beneficial planets occupy it or influence it and so on and so forth, you would enjoy very successful relationships, including the sexual component as well too. So um, starting off with, you know, a skeleton uh, set of rules with my, uh, with my teacher and uh, many case histories and armed with, you know, the science of sex, as it were, in, in the human experience, I put together this book and it took me two years to write it. And I was kind of tired of it at the end, but and I had cut it off. I'd, I wrote 60 case histories, but I ended up dropping 12 of them who were still living, living um you know, studies. And I thought in, in a litigious age, uh, as we are in, maybe I'll just leave those out. I can't afford to be sued. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's a very informative book. Uh, I mean, even somebody who doesn't know Vedic astrology, I swear that any Western astrologer could pick this up. And they already know the meanings of planets, the meanings of signs, the meanings of houses. It's very quick and easy to put together. The only thing is we're using a sidereal zodiac. But if you forget about that, it's just like, you know, dipping into water like you've done before and you can swim again just like, you know, you did once before. So it's a pretty easy conversion. Um, okay. What can I say about this? It's it's a great yeah. uh, book to give uh, people a sense of, well, you know, you go out in the dating world, you know, you have your own desires and you'll meet X number of people. And if only you were armed with a horoscope, you might know where to put your efforts and where not to worry about, you know, putting your efforts into it. Because there are some planets, Moon and Venus, for instance, are your notoriously romantic planets. Moon is by nature nurturing, sympathetic, intuitive, domestic. Venus is amorous, aesthetic, loving, sensual. Those two planets, if they influence your ascendant, so if you have uh, Taurus rising, Cancer rising, or Libra rising, 
one of those two planets rule your ascendant. And then if one of those two planets is rising or setting in the horoscope and therefore influencing yourself in a, you know, astrologically significant way, these can be sort of tags that say you're a romantic, you're a sympathetic, sensual person. And these people are the ones that sort of naturally gravitate towards relationships. They're um, already positive about the prospect for a relationship. Conversely, uh, there are another two planets, Mercury and Saturn, which are quite, hmm, let's say, cynical, ambivalent, judgmental about the whole prospect of uh, relationships. Mercury, for instance, is always regarded in the pantheon of planets as being adolescent, kind of youngish, you know, immature. And so a an adolescent or an immature person is not ready for adult relationships. Okay, just, and then on the other hand, Saturn. Saturn, the most distant planet in our solar system, is regarded as literally cold, uh, literally distant, and figuratively cold. A person who is, and they, Saturn also rules old people too. So you've got Mercury who's too young, Saturn who's too old, Mercury who's too fickle, Saturn who's too serious. Those two planets are anathema to the idea of romance. So if you have uh, Gemini or Virgo rising, or if you have Capricorn or Aquarius rising, there's a bit of a hard-nosed sort of attitude towards relationships. Well, I don't know if this is good for me. I'd rather be by myself. I'd rather play games. I'd rather watch hockey than be involved in a relationship, all this sort of thing. So if you've got that kind of person with those ascendants uh, rising, or if Mercury or Saturn uh, uh, plays a dominant influence upon the horoscope, these people are less inclined, in fact, even ambivalent, maybe even totally reluctant. To engage in relationships. Now, if you were to know that beforehand, you would not waste your dating dollars dining and whining somebody who is of a mercurial Saturnian disposition, because at the end, they're just not going to put out because they're not inclined. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm right. being crude uh, for illustrative yeah, purposes. That's the way it is. <laughs> whereas the, whereas the, the lunar and, and Venusian types are already inclined. They're halfway there already, as long as you treat them decently recently, they're ready to engage because they are romantics. They're hopeful, optimistic. Uh, Mercury and Saturn are kind of like pessimistic, judgmental, going to analyze the situation too much. Okay, well, I'll go out with you about what kind of job you got? What's your degree? You know, where do you live? You know, there are all these sort of, you know, ifs, <laughs> ands, and buts, the caveats. Yeah, Moon and Venus are not like that. So this is a helpful thing for anybody. And, you know, through, um, you know, uh, informed horoscopy, we can look at any chart. Well, we can look at any chart. Some of them are easy to judge. Some of them are more complicated. Let's let's be fair. It's like medicine. Somebody walks in, doc, I feel terrible. And the doctor takes one look and says, I can tell by your complexion, stick out your tongue or whatever. You got this. That's mm -hmm. wrong with you. Another person has got to go through a battery of tests and the doctor still doesn't know. I got to get a colleague to judge, right? So horoscopy can be complicated, but there are a lot of rules here that make it easier for you to engage and do what we call force distribution. Uh, put X number of people in this camp and say, you're less likely to engage and another whole bunch of people in the other camp and say, you are likely to engage. And now if you, you know, mix the engagees <laughs> with, with each other, you'll have a party. Whereas the ones who are ambivalent and reluctant, well, you know, they can go off to the library or go watch a hockey game or something or, or go home by themselves. I mean, because that's sort of their fate or destiny. Planets are drivers of psychological impulses. There's other factors in the horoscope that say, actually, no matter how much of a romantic you are and how hard you work it, maybe it'll never play out anyway. That's a different thing, right? You can want it. You know, this is the... Um, uh, uh, What's his name? Tony Robbins, School of Thought, mm -hmm. right? Tony Robbins, motivational speaker, who says, in effect, look, if you just want it bad enough, you'll get it. And how many people go to these millionaire mind seminars yeah, right? wanting to be yeah. millionaires? And do they all become millionaires? No, oh, they've all done not. the right things, but they don't have the fate for it. So uh, th that's another factor. There's also, you know, when we're talking about relationships, there's also the free will of the other person, right? So as much as you can say, I want to be with that person, yeah, you got free will involved too. So we'll talk more about all these fun things we're heading to our next commercial break. You're listening to The Pleasure Zone here on Inspired Choices Network, and we'll be right back after this commercial. Are you secretly a voyeur, wondering what's going on in other people's sex lives? 
What if now is the time for a totally different sexual evolution? Are you interested in people who are pioneers of different sexual and pleasurable practices? Lean in now with Milica Yelenich, where she will entice you and your body to know your own pleasure zone. On the Pleasure Zone radio show with sensual movement artist Milica Yelenich, you'll receive tools, inspiration, and a foundation to allow yourself to receive more in your sex life and quite possibly other areas of your life as well. Listen for The Pleasure Zone with Milica every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Central Time, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and 5 p.m. Pacific Time on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Interested in masturbating for money, copulating for consciousness, and pleasuring on purpose? 21 Days of Sexual Magicism with sensual movement artist Milica Jelenic is an exploration of tools, processes, and actions that you can use to create more for your life, your body, your money inflows, and so much more. Graduated learning for all levels of interest. Learn at your own pace via video classes or join the yearly live class. Take a peek at www.melitzajelenic.com. How wonderful would it be to carry your favorite Inspired Choices Network host with you throughout your day? Well, now you can. Inspired Choices Network now has its very own mobile app. Our free app offers live streaming shows along with thousands of podcasts and TV episodes. Our shows cover a wide variety of topics. Whether you're waking up with us, carrying us through the day, and taking us to bed with you, we're always here for you to enjoy. We're easy to find. Just search for Inspired Choices Network in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. This is The Pleasure Zone with sensual movement artist Melitza Yelenich. To participate in the program today, join our live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. You can also make the choice to ask or comment by email, info at melitzayelenich.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back, my sweet pleasure seekers. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Alan Anand, who's a Vedic astrologer, also an author, and all-around funny guy. If you want to follow him on social media, go find him and follow his work. Uh, also, go get his book. So, Alan, can they get... They can get your book on Amazon. Can they also, is, are there links through your uh, website as well to get that? Or is it specifically just through Amazon right now? Uh, you will find links on my websites uh, for the book, but those will simply lead you to Amazon. So the best thing to do is just go Alan and and Amazon books and bingo, you'll find me that way. Awesome. So other than this book, all of your your uh, sexy noir books on, on the astrologer gone rogue detective. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> those, those are all also ones that we can Everything find. Everything is there on Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. Easy one-stop shopping. So for, so for in the last two years, with all your research through the, the you know, historically great sexy people and um, looking at their charts, were there any people that you found the most outstanding or was there somebody who stands out the most that you were studying that you're like, you know, stays in your mind? Uh, Wilt Chamberlain is an outstanding oh. example because, uh, you know, what's his claim that he, that he slept with something like 15,000 women or 10,000. Yeah. Uh, I mean, people have taken him to task on that. Like, well, are you exaggerating a little bit? You know, that means since the you know age of 15, you had one and a half women every day. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he allegedly kept a day timer in which he logged all his conquests, including ratings on women as well too uh, and this sounds you know kind of salacious but uh, he said he never ever once slept with a married woman which is something and uh, did he, uh, he say what that he knew of I'm sure <laughs> well that may be true too lied. yeah <laughs> uh, but you know and he said he valued women who were well read and well traveled and, and enjoyed good food and obviously enjoyed sex he had in his his uh, his uh, 
the bedroom of his mansion, uh, king size bed, needless to say, and with a remote control, it would open the uh, panel in the roof to have a window on the on the stars. Uh, you know, he thought it was a very romantic thing to do. Uh, mm -hmm. He said he never wanted to get married because he he simply enjoyed his sex life too much, and he thought marriage would. Yeah, interfere with that. Uh, and it, but he said he did fall in love like half a dozen times, and he he struggled hugely to push them away at the time when he he still wanted to be with them, but felt that if he did that, that would be the end of another part of his life. Uh, he's a pretty remarkable case. Um, you know, there's I got 48 case studies in in this book, so it's pretty remarkable. Uh, Marlena Dietrich is another one, uh, you know, famous film star of the uh, the silent era coming out of Europe, and then came to uh, Hollywood in the early days. Uh, she was a cross-dresser back in the days of the Weimar Republic in Berlin and had, uh, you know, a pretty, pretty uh, wild and active uh, love life with members of both sexes. And uh, she, um, you know, uh, had a coterie of gal pals in, uh, in Hollywood that were all of a similar persuasion, uh, either lesbian or bisexual, and they would trade stories and, uh, you know, partners sometimes. And she had a hugely active love life as well, too. Uh, Sarah Bernhardt as well, too, claimed to have had over a thousand lovers. You know, she was wow. fated and dined and wined and pursued by royalty all over Europe. Uh, this was in the 19th century. That's another, you know, infamous case. Jimi Hendrix, I mean, was uh, admittedly, they say there was nothing he was better at other than guitar than sex. I mean, sex and guitar <laughs> were his, his primal pursuits. And that, you know, he, you know, once he got into his heyday, uh, never went to bed with women solo. There was always two or maybe an, yet another standby, like two or three women. Um, they said that he went through women like Kleenex. I mean, okay, so some of this is not admirable in, in today's environment, perhaps, you know, with STDs and all the rest of that. But, you know, there hugely, were STDs then too, but they didn't seem to give Yes, they didn't get that. the airplay that they, that that they no. did in day. Uh, uh, Rajneesh, you know the famous, um, oh, yeah. you know Indian uh, sex guru, you know yeah. successfully rebranded himself as Osho. But you know, in his day, this was back in the '60s and '70s uh, in India, they're basically a, a kind of a devoted to sex uh, ashram where people would go yeah. there and have basically bacchanals for uh, days and weeks on end, and everyone encourage you really uh, get naked and have fun and get you know uh, and and squeeze every last bit of pleasure out of you Alan, and your did you fellow, go to those? fellow deputies did you, nah, I was too young to go yeah. and besides not even in the 80s a gentleman no, never tells okay. a gentleman okay, okay. never tells unless you're in the famous book right and then <laughs> so did any of their charts look like when you read their stories and then you looked at their charts to was there like did it make sense to you when you looked at it you went oh yeah that makes sense like well you, what were you some gotta, that just made total sense you got to remember that you know the case studies that i ended up using are of course i mean this is in effect a kind of a textbook right and when you're yeah. teaching principles you don't use crappy examples right you use examples that illustrate the very thesis that you're attempting to uh sure. use but i had to read like well you know i ended up writing 60 uh case histories but i probably read about you know 150 detailed you know sex life biographies but in many a time the chart did not stand up to the scrutiny of the chart it had only one mm -hmm. or two principles that showed that you know they were a horn dog or whatever or or a nymphomaniac but when what you actually want is a, is a chart that's rich with the principles and it has not only one but two but three of these classic principles that said that they you know were highly passionate individuals and you know would uh, stand no uh, interference with you know the pursuit of their pleasures and those are the ones that make good case studies and others i use you know, people that really did have like wildly rampant, uh, super active sex lives, because the very story of their 
sex life made for good reading in itself. So sometimes mm -hmm. I would, you know, I'm trying to balance that uh, people with a really good story, but also a matching horoscope that actually successfully illustrates all those principles. I mean, this book is half case studies, but there are illustrative case studies. There's maybe 200, 250 words of uh, mini bio. Uh, and then like 300 words or so of astrological delineation that explain why they are like they are. I mean, the book is pretty rich. I mean, I could have just stuck to uh, horoscopy as well to, you know, strict astrological principles. But I worked in, you know, famous love stories of history, you know, Antony and Cleopatra, Romeo and Juliet, partly to illustrate some uh, basic principles of human nature, uh, famous, uh, you know, uh, erotica of, of the, uh, of the, uh, over the years, like the story mm -hmm. of all, uh, Delta of Venus, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, etc. And again, you know, summarize those with a point to uh, drawing connections between principles that appeared in the book uh, and the primary planets, which are uh, Moon and Venus, the Romantics, what I call the good girls of the Zodiac because they are the female mm -hmm. and the romantics versus the bad boys of the zodiac which are mars who is a warrior and saturn who is a control freak and so those two you know pairs those two good girls and those two bad boys that's the magic combination to have a party mm -hmm. going you need a good girl and you need a bad boy Better yet, if you have two good girls and two bad boys coupled in the same chart, you've got a little mini orgy going on in the horoscope. And such a oh, horoscope then is likely to catch fire. And then there's two other points in a, in a horoscope that are play a significant role. In Western astrology, it's called the North Node of the Moon and the South Node of the Moon. There's simply points in the moon's uh, orbit where eclipses occur. In Vedic astrology, they have names, Rahu and Ketu. So they're a uh, celestial serpent, a head and tail of a you know, symbolic serpent. They are like adding, they're like adding accelerants to the bad boys and good girls of the Zodiac. It's like you can have bad boys and good girls in a room together. So you bring in some alcohol or drugs because Rahu and Ketu, they rule stimulants of all kinds. And they all, they also rule sort of kinkiness, uh, weird stuff. Uh, outside the box kind of thinking. So, you know, it's all that sort of dimension. Good girls and bad boys add this cocktail, shake and stir, <laughs> and then you get a pretty volatile combination. And that basically, in essence, is the formula for sexual um, energy in a horoscope. When you have at least one good girl coupled with one bad boy, I mean, that is the bare minimum. And then you know, pile on some more if you can, and you have a little party and mix it up and it can be, uh, then you get some pretty remarkable case studies. And in these case studies that I used, there's, there's uh, no, excellent examples. It's really quite a, a, a learning package and, and, and fun reading too. Even if it's just for the vicarious delight of reading about 48 people who had outstanding sex lives. I mean, I got a little standard biography. What are they famous for in life? Actor, writer, magician, whatever, basketball player. But then, you know, more than half of their little mini bio is about their sex life and what they did to whom and so on. I've got a good mix of uh, the heterosexual and uh, the homosexual. For instance, um, a, ba, 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 who's in here? Um, Christopher Isherwood. I don't know whether you know him, a famous writer. Mm -hmm. Robert Mapplethorpe. Do you remember him? He was a famous New York photographer who, who became famous for taking pictures of black penises. How would oh, you not yes, know about this? Know about yes, I do know about that one. I just didn't know his name, but yeah, I do know about yeah, that one. And, uh, and uh, there's a few others. I mean, there, there's, there's a nice mix here. Andre Gide, another famous um, uh, writer of yesteryear, a Somerset mom, another uh, British writer of yesteryear, uh, all, um, you know, sort of uh, infamous uh, homosexuals. Uh, Somerset mom was a British writer who enjoyed great success, but he was, you know, living a kind of a scandalous life where he, so he moved to the Riviera. And he said the the Riviera is a nice sunny place for shady characters. And he used to have like all night bacchanals with, uh, you know, friends and, and local boys. He had a, you know, a buddy who would go out as a kind of a procurer and always have a fresh stock of fresh young flesh for pool parties and visitors who would go, you know, to his uh, villa and see that they were shocked, like just 
couldn't believe the 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 level of <laughs> sexual activity going on. Anyway, so he's one of the case studies as well. I've cherry picked a lot of these for their exciting value as far as reading goes. So you sort of you learn a lot of astrology and you learn a lot about other people's sex lives. Plus, which I worked in all the sort of uh, you know statistics on divorce, marriage, divorce. Um, you know, sex in the brain, academic studies on sexuality, covered all those famous people that, uh, you know, wrote about sex, Kraft Ebbing, Sigmund Freud, Havelock mm -hmm. Ellis, uh, what's his name, um, uh, Alfred Kinsey, Masters and Johnson, mm -hmm. and Cher Height, and actually did a little astrological profiles of them too, to illustrate oh, why would such academics be so obsessed about, well, obsessed, obsessed yeah. so interested, well, I mean, some people did. Sure. I mean, uh, Alfred Kinsey, like, totally got into it. He was very obsessed, yeah. Yeah, he uh, he and his wife had uh, sex with uh, with many of their friends and professional associates. He reconverted his attic into being a little kind of a sex cave and uh, filmed mm -hmm. everybody. And they filmed and, a lot too. Yeah, he I did. Mean, he did. They were, it was all for research, Alan. So you know that's what they were up to. You could justify <laughs> so much by saying it's research. It's all I mean, research. all I did for research was read a lot of books. Okay. I love it. Sure, sure, sure. So for those of you who are listening, uh, we've only got a few minutes left of the show. I know time flies when you're talking sex and marriage and love and all things sexuality. Sedona. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I've got to say this if you, if I've got yes, one minute have, to say it you've so, got it yeah you've got you've got a course going on and love to yeah, hear this, this whole book basically I'm going to teach the you know the cream of it in a course uh, a weekend immersion in Sedona exactly two months from now uh, June 1st to 4th uh, in oh, Sedona Arizona a retreat uh, put on by Shine Sanctuary so if now if you google Shine Sedona, Sanctuary, Sex, Vedic Astrology, Alan Anand, whatever, any combination of that, <laughs> you'll find your way to this site and you'll be able to, you know, plug into that as well. It's a little bit much for the lay person, but for anybody who knows any astrology, uh, there's an introductory uh, component for those who know some astrology, but don't know anything about Jyotish or Vedic Astrology. That primes them for the basic stuff, and then you can be uh, part of this uh, workshop, uh, immersion intensive, and learn a whole lot about seeing people through their horoscopes in a very different way. It really is quite powerful. Well, let's get you guys out getting the book. Um, for those of you who don't, you know, who have no idea and are just now getting interested, go get the book. Also, contact Alan, get your chart done, and see what you, who you are when it comes to your love life and your sex and like, are you with the person that you're, you know, work, is, are you guys working well together? Is your relationship mixed up and messed up? Find out. And so you can contact Alan, search him up, Alan Anand. Also definitely check out the books, all of them through amazon.com. If you're into uh, all things fun that have to do with, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> like as it was called the Sherlock Holmes uh, I love that <laughs> the Sherlock Holmes version of sex and all things fun and with Sherlock Holmes with astrology like how fun is that so if you're into that go get any and all of his books for sure and I encourage you to if you are curious and if you already do astrology and this show has given you some ideas or insights and curiosity check out the course that is going on at Shine in um in Sedona, what a great location! Like you can't get much more woo woo than Sedona, other than here in Ontario near where I live, which we are like the Sedona of the North. So, you know, there's all these Sedonas in the world. Lots of great places with converging energy. So, for those of you who are also just wondering, like, what did I just listen to? Like, what? I just got so much information. I don't even know what just happened. And some of those books that Alan were mentioning. Uh, that interests you, you know, like we were talking about the uh, the the sex lives of famous people. Check some of these books out. They might just get you interested, intrigued, and, and get you going into a whole new research uh, 
ideas for your life. I love researching sex, so any and all books on that are great. And in two weeks, I'm going to be geeking out with actually Ceres, uh, who has a Ceres Rivas, who has a show on Inspired Choices Network, also who loves to talk about sex. And we're going to be geeking out about our favorite sex books and sex TV shows at some point as well. Thank you, Alan, for coming on. We've got five seconds left. I want you all to stay tuned in and turned on. Thank you for listening to The Pleasure Zone with sensual movement artist Milica Yelenich. The Pleasure Zone returns next Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Mountain, and 5 p.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. We hope you'll join us. Until then, have the best week of your life by choosing to be turned on and tuned in to your body.